Um, so I just want to share what we've learned on our own site, um, which is 10 acres in the Mad River Valley for the last 11 years. Um, and also what's emerging on our new farm, which is a larger scale, more of a, a true farm rather than a homestead, which is in um, central, it's about 40 minutes south, um, in central Vermont, which is a 175 acre site, where we're scaling up what we've been doing for getting on 11 years now in Moortown in the Mad River Valley. And where we are there is actually, it's 10 acres, but everything we're doing there for the most part can be done on three acres. Three to five acres, 99% of what we're doing there can be done if you just have a few acres. If you have one acre, you can still do most, almost most of it, at least, let's say, 75 to 80%. So don't be fooled by, well, I don't have 10 acres, I can't do this. You can still do most of it on a much smaller acreage than that. That's important to remember. We're not really using half of our site um, very much at all, except for the odd for, um, lumber harvest, uh, because it's cliffy and marginal, really marginal uh, land. We're on land that is um, no, you know, would never be considered farmland today. It's, there's boulders and ledge everywhere. If you ran a tractor more than about 20 feet, unless you got really lucky, you'd break whatever you were dragging behind it. Um, it's not, you know, not ag soil. There was 10 to 12 inches of um, silty loam there. The, the soil maps are not wrong, and that's what they say for our site. And now there's about zero to two inches, because that's the result of the last 200 years of land use in New England, is we've lost, you know, the elevation of New England has dropped a foot or two or three, depending where you are, in the last, last few hundred years, because of our, our land use. And because we're on a slope, so we've lost most of our topsoil across most of the landscape. There's still some down in the floodplains, where 90 plus percent of our food production is in the 10 percent of land that is considered 10 to 15 percent that's considered ag soil and almost all that is down in the floodplain. So what we're working on is how to farm, how to garden and farm and do ecological restoration on the rest of the landscape on what's most of New England but also what's most of the world because most of the world isn't you know deep soil low sloping land. Um, obviously it's important we use that well but but what do we do with the rest of it? This is what the site is, is beginning to look like um, in the last handful of years. It's, it's a place where we're not just growing food, but we're growing a lot of medicine, where we're harvesting water, where we're building soil, um, where there's a, a very robust ecosystem developing, much more diverse ecosystem than was there uh, when we got there. Yet it's also kind of side yielding a lot of values to the people, not just you know the frogs and um, the bird life and the, the pollinators and everything else, but where we're getting a lot of high value um, medicinal crops, food crops, um, and as well our, our fuel. That's a big, big thing I'll chat about. So they, they need to stay warm. And this site is, a, the, our, uh, the main site I'll talk about is a homestead focus. We're not, the goal is not to turn anything on the land into food, the, into uh, money there. It's to turn it into basic needs first and whatever we have as a surplus to sell. So like this last week, I took uh, maybe six dozen duck eggs to some local markets. But we're not raising those ducks to do that. It's not a, a most, I think it's hard to find a good value exchange between turning land into money. So that's not our main focus. We, we do do that when there's a surplus, however. Um, especially on a small marginal piece of land, that trade is even harder to come by, um, where, it's a, where there's, a, there's a positive value. Most of when, when we get a surplus off the land, it, it doesn't necessarily make it worthwhile to go burn two gallons of gas to drive 20 minutes each way to bring five pounds of anything to a market. You know, from an energy perspective, of course, it's just crazy that we do do that, but we do while the gas, that, 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 five, uh, that, that 20 pounds of material we're burning up in the car is a lot less valuable than the five pounds or maybe even 100 pounds we're bringing to market. Um, so. This is just, these are just some shot site, uh, shots of the site to start off. It's an integrated system, as I'm sure many of you know. We're not just growing one thing in one spot and one thing in another. The idea is to grow them all overlaid with one another. So when people come to the farm and they're, they're like, well, where's, where's the pasture? It's like you're standing in it. This is the pasture. This is where we grow our fruits. This is where we grow sometimes even our veggies. Um, we, we're trying to integrate perennial cropping for the most part with grazing, all while harvesting 
as much solar energy and water that falls from the sky as possible to then transform that into as much value as possible for the longest period of time possible, right? That's permaculture. That's just regenerative land use and also very resilient land use. I just want to talk about context here for a moment because it's important that we're all on, on the same page with that. We're all working on this, whether you're doing this kind of work or anything else, the context is that we happen to live in just a two, three generations into an experiment of converting um, a society of production um, and, and transforming that into a society of, of consumption, replacing production with consumption, right? Literally paving over working landscapes for you know, this kind of pattern. Now, it may not be this intense here in Williston, but it's pretty close. It's the same pattern. It's the same one-way linear flow of energy that we know can't last forever or even for very long, but that's, that's just what we're working in. That's, that's, the, um, that's our context, and so it's very important to understand that. Right? You know, for the most part, beef doesn't um, come to most people, at least in this country and increasingly in the world, um, through, through grazing systems anymore. This is what it looks like. Right? This is where most um, eggs and chickens are raised, although it's hard to even call them chickens now because of how um, engineered, you know, these units of production is how we have the industrial mindset sees sees life now. Um, so this is this is where we are, right? It's amazing that that eggs can even be made in this way, that they'll that a bird will produce an egg. It's a real testament to how resilient life is. Um, more context, right? Has anyone heard of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico? This is where they start, right? This is, anyone know what this is? It's a feedlot, right? It looks kind of just like an abstract painting, but it's just a feedlot from space. That's where, that's where the nutrients go and the antibiotics and the pharmaceuticals. To the right there, that's an, a big algae bloom and, and uh, a concentration of a lot of other gnarly stuff, much worse than algae, of course, makes its way down to the Gulf of Mexico where it chokes out almost every living thing where that outflow is. Um, yeah, those are all cows, all those little, yeah, those are all beef cows, right? And so we, um, this is where those, where the food for the beef cows comes from, right? To here, goes to the right, and then out to the Gulf of Mexico, right? It's a one-way flow of resources. Totally dead end, right? It can't work, but it can for a little while while energy is cheap. And we've, we've just masterminded how to do this. Um, of course, the, at least while energy is flowing, and is, is very inexpensive. But of course, the cost, besides ecological, is really a human health cost. We know the cost is in species, but it's also in, in almost more intensely in the cost of our own health or lack thereof. Right? We're in this amazing position of spraying chemicals on our food that no one would ever say are edible just to keep them producing. Um, it's really phenomenal. So that, that's just where we're at. And the social cost also is, is, is impossible to wrap our minds around, right? Because you can't do this without cheap energy. You've got to get the cheap energy somewhere. The cheap energy just doesn't flow off the hillsides all over the world. It's only in a, it's only in a small number of places. So we have to, we have to go get it. And um, that's, it's important context. I don't, I don't say this to um, depress us, but I, I bring it up because... Um, it drives the rate of change that we'll see in our lifetime. And as we're entering the second part of the oil age, the, the important thing to take home here is that the rate of change that we'll see in our lifetime is probably many, many times the rate of change that, that we saw in our parents' lifetime or in our grand, pa grandparents' lifetime. Because the whole movement towards cheap energy and mining out, you know, literally, um, salvaging, just scavenging. Humans as large, mega-scale industrial scavengers of ancient resources is just getting going. This is the oil age part two here. Anyone know wh where this is? Tar sands, right. And this is mega-scale. These tar sands are, are over a huge portion of the earth. And I bring this up because, of, you know, the old adage, if you don't change direction, you'll get where we're headed, right? Well, we're headed is, is this direction, at least from a from a industrial standpoint. There's, there's really no um, resistance to this among leadership at the national or international scale. Um, we'll probably, if we haven't already, there'll be that pipeline going through the United States now to ship the energy off to China, um, even though we had a total 
we thought we had a change in administration, uh, what was it, six years ago. Um, it's the same direction, right? We're actually running there mo faster than ever. So the consequences of this will keep mounting. I mean, when I was in college, I was right here in, in class um, not too long ago in this crazy building. And, um, and I thought, well, at some point in the next five years, we'll turn this ship around and we'll have all this old, all this old debt to repay ecologically and socially, um, but we'll, we'll switch directions. We're, we're not at all. And I, I know that's totally depressing. It's very sad. Um, but it, the, the important thing to understand about that is that we have to design for that. We have to really look at that in the face and say, okay, how are our systems going to deal with this, this rate of change, this level of toxicity, this rate of climate impact, and also this rate of economic impossibility? Because we know we can't keep going in this direction for, for a very long time on the whole without the economics of it not panning out, right? This is where all the shale gas is. Hopefully it's not really there, but we we'll probably will frack it all out if it is. Um, again, unless we change course 180 degrees, the climate impact we know is starting to get all really whacked out. Um, whether it's this or just volcanoes going off naturally, the climate's always shifting. Um, this is between 1990 and 2006. You guys have probably seen this map, some of you. This is Arbor Day Foundation. The USDA hasn't updated their maps just yet. We see Zone 3 has basically moved out of Vermont. Um, and the other zones marching northward. There's problems to this, right? Malaria, Lyme disease, everything's moving north. Pests are all switching around. But so are there also opportunities. We now grow peaches where I live, which we couldn't have done 20, 30, 50 years ago, except rarely every now and then on some years. We're mostly zone five where I live now. We've only seen one zone four winter in Moortown, at least where I am in Moortown, in 10 years, where it's been below negative 24, below 20, negative 25 or below truly zone four. Um, it's been zone five, so we're a zone warmer. There's dozens of more useful, uh, highly valuable species you can grow in zone five, six, seven than you can in zone four, three, two, one as you get colder. In order to hedge our bets here, we're planting species from climate zone one to seven because we know it's never consistent that we're going to hang out with one climate zone. We all should do that if we're, unless we want to gamble on the climate just staying the same which we shouldn't do even if it was 500 years ago. We shouldn't make that gamble because the climate's always been doing this. That's, I mean, inherent in the understanding of climate is shift, is changing. Um, climate change is kind of a funny term. It's like a non sequitur. So, yeah, that's what climates do is they change. <laughs> they stay consistent for a little while. They're consistent enough in the last 10,000 years, scholars think that that's actually why civilization could emerge, that they had to be very consistent. The Earth's climate's been inconsistent enough for a very long time that civilization, it was too much impact to the system. We couldn't form civilization. It was too crazy on planet Earth. And finally, after things, you know, if you look at the emergence of civilization, it coincides very, in a very parallel way with a mellowing and a stabilization of climate. Well, it may just be civilization that causes the climate in part to destabilize again. That's kind of cool in some ways, right? I mean, there'll be major suffering. It's not a, it's not a totally cool thing, but it's, it's kind of a big karmic circle, right? Um, that it, our climate's unhinged by the same thing that, mel that a stable climate, relatively stable climate needed to be in place before we could establish human civilization, right? We know 350 parts per million are where apparently a lot of the science says we need to be. We're talking a lot about let's get to 350, but let's also talk about, well, let's, what happens when we get to 1,000? Because that's where we're going, or 500, or 750, whatever you name it. Now, a lot of people say, oh, this is impossible. We get above 350, we start going in here, we're all toast. We're done. Should we just give up? Right? Because we're going there. So how do we design for these systems? How do we say, okay, this is going to be crazy. How do we create the most robust human, social, ecological, soil, wa soil building, water harvesting, climate, chaos, adaptable, human habitat systems. That's, that's what we're working on. Um, that's what permaculture is all about. So right, you see a pattern here. It's, you don't have to read any of the headings of this. If, if you can, can't make out a pattern here, um, maybe look a little harder, <laughs> right? This is the pattern. This is the part of the, of the life cycle of complex systems we can't spend too much time in, no matter what your politics or religion. We, we can all agree on one thing. You just can't hang out right here for, for too long. It doesn't last right there. That's where we are, right? We either easily, easy to think this is peak disaster. Oh, just throwing the towel. 
enjoy a powder day, go chill in the Caribbean because, you know, life's short, civilization's short. But, and, and I, I say, I recommend doing that a little bit for sure. But um, because uh, remember, the comet's always going to come. It'll, this whole thing will be vaporized at some point. So don't worry too much. Really, I mean, it will. We'll get hit by a comet again and just re press reset and in a few million years, there'll be a lot of cool stuff again. Um, that's totally good to remember. Don't, there's no real need to stress about it all. <laughs> We're just nothing in the universe and that's fine. Um, but we like people, we, I love you know, polar bears and, and everything. It's all really beautiful and it's all here and that's a good thing. So let's see this craziness as peak opportunity too, right? Because life is good and life wants to live and there must be some wisdom in that. So let's do what we can to help it out. And that's also really, really fun and really invigorating. I, I personally find it's about the only thing I don't get bored of is, is trying to promote living things where I live. Everything else I've mostly gotten bored of. Um, so this is maybe something that we can attach ourselves to for the long haul, it's compelling. For us doing this work, We've had to start looking in the last five to seven years around the world at similar climates. It's important we all understand the idea of climate analogs. Right? Where is a similar climate to where you live? Whether it's Virginia or Ohio or New York City or Vermont. Where is a similar climate? And what have people been doing there for a long time? Because chances are they figured out more things than we figured out here in North America. At least than our, our modern last few centuries has figured out. There's been incredible, incredibly sophisticated, enduring land use here for, for probably four to 10,000 years before Europeans got here, but we wiped a lot of that off the map. If you're interested in those systems, check out Charles Mann's book, 1491, among others, um, because he talks a lot about what was going here, around here. Probably, as far as we can tell, was a continental scale forest garden. Really amazing, a lot to learn there. But in other parts of the world, some of these systems are still um, in existence. You can still see them a little bit. So we look across this, this line of climate analogs, and it's, it's not a line of equal latitude. That's important to, to remember. We're not in southern France, totally different. There's global air and ocean currents that, that just make our climate do this kind of curve. And in parts of the world, along this blue line, there are systems that are in, have been in existence for not just hundreds, but for thousands of years. Meanwhile, we got to, you know, the last few hundred years, we've developed a system that can only persist, a food system that is totally annual-based, tillage-based, and can only exist with massive free energy inputs, cheap energy inputs. Right? The Midwest won't run without fossil fuels. It won't, it won't be productive. There's no, in the current method, right? there's no output, there's no bushels, billions of bushels of corn and wheat and soybeans without that. So we managed to figure out a system that doesn't work. What does work? What does work around the world? And to also understand as we look at climate analogs what this place is, and as anyone who's traveled understands, when you come back home, you start to look at your own place with fresh eyes and actually see what it is a little more clearly. And when I've done that, I've come back to realize that this place where we live, this is right down the road from my house, this is a, a class four road that gets graded once every year or two is actually, we live in an incredibly resilient place, one of the most resilient in the world. What happens to this road if we stop just running heavy machinery on it every year? It becomes the forest again, yeah. There's already more roads through Vermont than there are now in existence. There already were those roads built in the past. If you've walked around the hills of Vermont, you see them. They're usually next to stone walls, They're by, they lead to old foundations, and they're everywhere. We live in a place that mulches itself every year. Right? And it's so it's wet enough and in a consistent enough way that soil wants to build here, much more than in the rest of the world, and most of the rest of the world. Right? This is what we did in New England, and also most of the world. Right? We didn't have gold, but we had timber. We logged it all out. I remember learning right here on this campus how what we did in Vermont. And I, I, I was surprised. We cut down all the trees, like 90 plus percent, right? Look, go look for old growth. <laughs> it's in a handful of spots. Um, this is the White River, actually. If you know South Royalton, there's a great swimming hole right here now, <laughs> right where these guys are standing on, on those logs. Mountain of logs was all logged out. And I remember thinking, well, who replanted all the trees? No one replanted the trees, right? They all replanted themselves, for the most part. There's a few plantations. But the whole landscape replanted itself. Now, it's much worse off. It's not a forest with chestnuts and, um, 
and, and healthy beech trees and, and a lot of other, and, you know, we used, it's important to remember we had a, a forest where the sugar maples were like from, from me to the wall here, all over the place, many of these sugar maples, six, eight foot diameter, and those were understory trees below chestnuts. We can't, you know, we don't understand that. We don't see it. Every now and then you can see a remnant of a stump like that. And our kids won't see those remnants either. even. If we go back to our grandparents, they could say they might have seen some of them even still alive cut down. So we, we, we're impoverished. Our landscape is not just natural right now. It's degraded. Um, we have an opportunity to move towards what, not just what used to be in terms of health and robustness and beauty and complexity and maturity, but also hopefully to, to even go beyond that because we, we know some things now we didn't know before. But the point here is we cut down all our trees, all the trees grew back. That's a resilient tendency of our landscape. What happens most of the world, you cut down your trees, you end up with a desert, right? Deforestation and desertification are the same process. Actually, in a lot of the world, you cut down just some of your trees and you make a desert. All right? We know what that's like. That's the story of civilization. You know, the Fertile Crescent had large forests in it. The Middle East was forested. Really, it was actually forested. I mean, it's hard to imagine because we just know it's been a desert for a while, for, for a lot of human generations, but not for most of time. Right? So this is the last bit of forest in these dry areas. And then when you desertify these, you deforest these lands, it takes someone who's a real genius like Jeff Lawton or some other people to actually bring health back to them. It takes very ingenious strategies to, not, nothing we can't do. We can reforest these areas, actually. It's amazing, the power for regeneration. But it's much more difficult than uh, regenerating Vermont and, and less brittle climates. And, and I, I bring this up to, to understand, so we all kind of have a sense of what are the tendencies here? Why is this landscape so resilient? Well, it has everything to do with water and its distribution. For the most part, water comes right evenly into New England, right? We get three to six inches of rainfall equivalent uh, uh, per month most of the year. Now, we might not get rain really for a month and then get eight inches or 20 like we did last June. Um, but for the most part, it's very even, and that's why our climate is so non-brittle. It's the evenness of moisture distribution, not the overall amount of moisture distribution. There's much more brittle climates that get 80 inches of rain a year. Monsoonal climates, they get the 80 inches in a, two months or a month, and then it doesn't rain. A lot of the world plays by much stiffer rules than we do here. That's difficult. That's a place that can, be, that can break very easily. We live in a place that's like this, and most of the world's like this. I lived in the Bahamas even, and it you know, very easy to destroy that landscape. We got all the rain in the monsoon there, and then almost no rain from midwinter <clears throat> till the hurricane season started again. So that's challenging, and we still know how to work in those places. How do we work here? Our biggest challenge is shocks to the system, right? This is Hurricane Irene two some odd years ago. Right before the power went out, I got this screenshot, and this is the amount of water flowing through people like Dorothy Todd know this well. Her house got you got bulldozed that day. Um, she's about 10 miles upriver from where I live. So this is, this is in Moortown, right here. It right, turned into a Himalayan scale river, you know, a pissed Himalayan scale river, right? And, and this is a factor of, for math folks, I think what is a factor of 100? This is 100 times. It's went from 80 cubic feet a second to over 20,000. That's, a, I think, it's a factor of 100. And that's thousands of times the volume, right? But what I want to put out there is this is just a natural event. Now, does human meddling cause these events to happen more often? Sure, probably. But it's also natural. Hurricane Irene's have been happening since forever, right? I mean, actually, this river did much crazier things when the ice was melting 10,000 years ago. That's where we mine out the gravel pits nowadays. The gravel pits hundreds of feet tall. You imagine what the rivers did then. But there wasn't anyone making uh, settled settlements in, the, in that time. It was too difficult, right? So but what we should also measure this in is in, you know, dump trucks of loads, dump truck loads of soil per minute, right? It should be D, DTPS or DTPM, right? That's, that's the consequence. That's why this is a problem, right? It's not a big deal to have, well, it's also a problem if you live down a floodplain. Sorry. Um, but, right. But the fact that we're conveyor belting out value that took 
thousands of years to accumulate in the hills, soil, organic matter, and we're losing it in the space of hours. What took thousands of years, and we're saying, okay, whew, that's gone. That's in Lake Champlain. Now, we're probably not gonna get it back from the bottom of Lake Champlain. That's the problem, right? We can, we can design settlements. We should not live in floodplains. It's not a big deal. I mean, we'll probably have to, eventually, we'll move out of the floodplains. We'll have to. We'll move our towns out of the floodplains. It's not a big deal. A lot of the world ha has known that for a while. But we can't afford to lose. So this is the loss of civilization you can see in this river. It's done it over and over again. Right? This is up on my farm at the same time. I'll talk about this in a minute. Where no soil was being moved. I was amazed. This was our first test event of what uh, a water holding landscape can do. This is down in our village. The fire station's right back over here is the first building flooded. It's the lowest building in our town. It's an interesting strategy from an emergency management standpoint. Um, you know, we're not, we don't, we're basically, we're just not thinking about what, what the earth does in our, in our, in our daily uh, planning or lack thereof, right? Here's our, our, our post office. This is about 6 p.m. before the flood actually crested quite a bit higher. This is where all that soil went, right? Our, our very large stormwater detention basin called Lake Champlain. And it's deep because if it wasn't very deep, you could just kind of hop across to the Adirondacks on mounds, like it'd be one big swamp, right? Because we put a lot of soil down there. Um, and it's, it's difficult to get it back from the lake. So meanwhile, up on our farm, we had a very different story. And this is the first um, real um, example of how robust, for me personally, of what, what a swaled, paddied, ponded, uh, water slowing landscape can do, where a, a landscape where we're slowing, spreading, and sinking water, SSS, what this can do. This wasn't the, the, the best day these sheep ever had. You know, they're like pretty wet, but not, you know, maybe a lot like Iceland where, where their heritage is. Um, but then up on our farm, they had an okay time of it. This is what the river looked like. couple few bits of soil moving there and then up on our farm the bottom settling pond is getting hundreds of gallons a minute right now after about five inches of rain in Hurricane Irene and there's no silt in it it's totally clear water even though I don't know, hundreds of thousands of gallons of water have landed on this landscape in the last 12 hours. We're not moving so any soil. I'll narrate this a little further. This Whatsoever. is the last part of our system, the Pretty bottom sweet. of our, our land. And I figured I'd go down there it's and good for the land. Silt. This and storm's good some, for this farm. Some some material while it's washing out and I realized that actually a lot of other farms pretty large storm, and houses there wasn't a speck of soil that was in the Mad River infrastructure the bridges and actually, roads off of here's the last whale coming in acres, we catch that much water as well and I was amazed because there was beautiful some, water some of that landscape actually does move beautiful rainwater from so the ocean they do think that, that this is probably after around. this is the water flowing in you can see right oh here. about and it blew Better me away because mile it made swales. me realize this that actually even if soil to does start moving on the hills, it can get recaptured over and over maybe, again if you give enough well, a lot of it's been through at least two ponds, some of it's been through three, Reed, swales, some of it's been through paddies, one, ponds, some of it's been through rice paddies, and, and all of it's been through swales. You give it enough opportunity to settle back out. So whatever happens, we're not losing that soil out forever to Lake Champlain, unless we mount some big dredging operation, which sounds expensive, um, to get that soil back. I'll talk about this in detail here in a minute, but I just want to look at some, some strategies from around the world that don't lose soil, that don't require um, a heavy amount of inputs, and can persist until that comet comes around again. Right. So here is the north part of the South Island of New Zealand. This is a highly profitable farm growing um, Kiwis, of course, hops, which is big. This is outside of Nelson. Has anyone been down there? Nelson, uh, northern part. Beautiful area, amazing climate. You can grow basically everything we grow, plus the whole Mediterranean suite of foods. Uh, I never knew a climate like this actually existed. And they're doing things very smartly here, right? They have their crops, peaches, cherries, plums, apples, pears, um, a whole bunch of other stuff all grown in these protected windrows, which are also productive crops in of themselves. 
Right? So what happens in this situation? You have, if, if south is to the left, you have super warm microclimates forming in places like this. In these south, north sides of each cell, you have cool areas to the, to the, um, to the north of the hedgerows, to the south sides of each cell. You have wildlife habitat, animals that can run from here through all of these hedges. You have ecosystem services like that. You have what happens when water lands up here and has to move downhill through this system compared to water landing up here, right? Instead of free, free, free flow, slow, a free flow movement down the slope, water ha is intercepted a thousand and one times in, in, a productive, in this productive landscape. Evapotranspirates, um, infiltrates back down into the ground, right? It's a three-dimensional, highly productive, high resiliency, high diversity landscape versus a two-dimensional landscape that most of New Zealand, actually, I was amazed, was doing, oversheeping, just over, not overgrazing, but grazing poorly, because this kind of landscape can be grazed as well. And actually, this landscape I was seeing in the north, in much of um, the central part of New Zealand was already creating arid climates, was already desertifying their land. I went to look at what I thought would be kind of um, sophisticated grazing, and I actually saw crazy grazing. I saw people irrigating pasture. Which, you know, where we are, you'd be like, what are you doing? You all right? <laughs> you know, you're watering your, 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 your acres and acres of grass. Um, because things are drying out so much, because they're wholesaling their trees, liquidating their forests, and they're on their third or fourth cycle of Pinus radiata, just monoculture um, mining. And they don't have as much of a resilient landscape to do that in. We do here, at least for now. And there were already drainages that, that drained thousands of acres, which were dry creek beds, like arroyos in their spring, at the beginning of their spring, which should be raging, you know, being able to kayak down. So it was incredible. That was a real um, rarity in, in New Zealand, unfortunately. Here's another example of an agroecosystem, of a, of, a, of a naturalized farming system that's, that's human-made. This is anthropogenic. No one, you know, this, isn't, this just didn't exist. People planted these trees. This is a nuttery. This is actually um, at an arboretum. Um, where it was, it was, um, it wasn't planted for agricultural purposes. But this is how nutteries work around the uh, look around the world. I'll show you some other photos of them in, in parts of Europe. We don't have examples of this in this country for the most part right now. People like Mark Shepard are pretty far along in creating this. Another hundred years, two hundred years, and they'll start to look like this. But here's a system that requires no tillage, no fossil, no input, no uh, fertilizer inputs. We say in permaculture, the forest. No one fertilizes the forest, yet it keeps growing. How's that possible, right? A nut tree, like a big oak or a walnut or chestnut, can produce as much nutrients as a cow every year for 200, 100, 200, 300 years with no, no one feeding the tree like a cow. It's worth paying attention to, right? That's pretty amazing. How does that work? Here's a system that inherently is protecting itself, right? It has a canopy buffering against the percussion of raindrops coming down, holding in moisture, shading its ground. You have roots going down dozens of feet if, pot, if the bedrock isn't there. You have a, a system that's highly robust in the face of, of drought and flood, right? Because flood in the case of you have no tillage, you have no exposed soil, and drought in the case of root depth, and in case of it shading itself, for many reasons. You have a, a drought-resistant system here. It could not rain for a month or two or even the whole growing season in New England, and oaks might still have a good year, right? Because they're, it's still moist 5, 10, even 3, 4 feet down into the subsoil. What happens to an annual crop if it doesn't rain for even sometimes a month, right? Your tomatoes, your potatoes, your corn, right? Th these aren't, those aren't plants that have been working on the root system for 100 years, right? just for even a month or two, right? Plants that we have to replant every year. This just replants itself. No one has to actually replant this, certainly not every year. So it's worth seeing what are the principles? How does that system work, right? The challenge is how do we turn these into human yields? We know that they're more robust and more permanent um, and more resilient than annual cropping systems. But how do we actually turn this into something that, that is a food system and a medicine and a fuel system for humanity? We know how to do that, but it's not something we're used to seeing. We'll talk about that in a moment. Even where there's been annual cropping in parts of the world, people have actually, at times, especially in Southeast Asia and parts of Polynesia, and a few other areas, but those are the best, most striking examples, people have figured out how to grow even annual tilled crops, even tillage. Yes, I know that's amazing. 
um, that tillage could be sustainable. What potentially it could be, but only if you reshape, the, only if you're catching, slowing, spreading, and sinking all of your water, if you're not losing any of your nutrients every year, or very little, right? So what people, I saw these photos growing up and throughout college, and I was like, wow, that's just amazing, it's so beautiful, but I didn't really get it until I started implementing these systems on my own landscape, and I didn't really realize that what these people were making the decision to do was to take generations of shaping these systems by hand, generations of digging. They didn't do these with excavators. They didn't have that, that available. They figured it was worthwhile to not have to fight gravity every year to actually make these systems by hand, which took generations, rather than for endlessly fighting the effects, the forces of entropy and gravity, and losing their soil every year. Let's just reshape the land to hold all of these nutrients and water, which is even more valuable than soil. It's really mind-numbing to, to think that, that these systems were made by hand, that the people in, who have lived in a place for thousands of years figured this, this is the way towards permanence. So there's something to learn there. We don't have anything that looks like this yet in this country. And I think it's partly, mainly because we haven't been here long enough. And then when, and then when we, um, well, our first wave of land use, like in New England, failed. We left to the Midwest. That was the great time of great abandonment in the late 1800s, mid-1800s, after the sheep craze. Went to the Midwest, where there was the best virgin soil in the world. We've mined that out now for what's just getting on a few generations. And we got fossil fuel inputs so we could keep that system going, using the soil simply as a media. It's really almost hydroponics. It's like chemical hydroponics, right? Um, so we haven't had to figure these things out yet. I think if we're here in New England, in this country, in hill country, in another hundred years, or certainly another thousand, and it might start looking like this, especially in Vermont. So I saw this photo a number of years ago and said to myself, wow, that could be Vermont. We don't, I've never seen anything like this in person, but there's snow on terraces. I thought all these things were, were tropical. And I realized then, a little around then, that we could do these things in, our, in, in this place as well. So this, my own farm started to become what friends joke is this kind of cross between Japan and Vermont. Uh, maybe we call it Jamont or a Jamontian form of land use. And it's kind of funny and interesting because I don't have any particular connection with Japan. I actually was planning to go before their tsunami and then nuclear, ongoing nuclear catastrophe. Um, but I never ended up going. And yet here my own landscape as just an attempt to work with the system to fit our systems to the land in a way that seemed to actually function well for the long term has started to look like other landscapes in other parts on the other side of the world. Um, it's interesting that that pattern is, is emerging. Um, so here's looking west on our farm um, towards the Long Trail Ridge, you know, towards the main spine of the greens, there's Camel's Hump. We're in Moortown, northern Madera Valley. You can see our patties, our grazing, all of it's grazed, but you see the sheep here, some terrestrial terraces, um, squash being grown here. This is all grazed um, perennials all down below here. That's all mulberry and um, chestnuts, apples, hazelnut, um, currants, elderberry, and a bunch of other stuff planted down there, um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. I'll, I'll talk about what these are in a moment. Some of the principles I'll, I'll mention here. I won't read them off to you, but they're, they're taken from my book, which has about 72 of them, I think. This, this um, this book's available, by the way, from Chelsea Green here at the conference uh, and on our website. This, this uh, slideshow talks about 10 of these principles in particular. I won't read them off, but you can see an example of them here. And I'll probably put the slideshow online and you can re re refer back to it. Right, so here's our 10 acres. And this is what was happening with the water when we moved there, wanting to run right off slope, right? Well, maybe 1,600 feet from top of the landscape, well, about 1,000 feet down to the bottom, dropping 150 feet or so in places. Now, a raindrop landing on top of this property has to go back and forth, back and forth, and travel almost a mile, depending where it lands, to get off the land. Right? That's, if you don't remember anything else from this presentation, I'd say that's one of the most important things, is what we're doing with water here, the idea of spreading pulses, and also thus fertility. And so getting the most out of the free energy that lands on your property is always, that's the backbone of everything any good farmer is trying to do, right? Is turning, is transforming the free lunch into value, just even from an economic perspective, never mind ecological. All right, so what's free? Sunshine, rainfall, subsoil, hopefully, unless you're on straight up bedrock, then bedrock's free. Use that as a, as a resource, right? 
But so what happens when it rains is most of the time we lose all our water off the landscape. We'll visit properties and maybe even look around your own property and you see water running after a rainstorm onto the land and then off the land. And we don't think anything of it. What if you walked outside and there was compost flowing through your site? Visiting a friend's property and, there, and it, after it rained or composted and there's compost running off the site. Do you think people would be like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's the, that's the stream of compost. It's, it's making its way on, under the property and off. No, you, compost is everything, right? I mean, that, besides water, the more compost, the better, right? The more we can produce. We, you would try to slow it down, spread it out, and deliver it to all parts of the landscape that needed those nutrients. Well, amazingly, we do this with water all the time. We just see it run off the property. Water is more valuable than compost. If you can only have one or the other, you definitely go for water. That's why there's living life on this whole planet. Right? Compost fertility is also valuable, but water is, is everything and then more. Right? Water actually contains a high amount of fertility. Um, and more fertility in rainfall now than since we've probably been walking upright because of all, all of our nitrogen pollution. We're putting more nitrogen into the atmosphere. It's coming back out in rain. So when everything greens up after a rainstorm, it's not just psychological. It's a fertilizing event every time it rains. So how are you going to use that as much as possible? Right, there's, it's a nitrogen event happening every time it rains. So that's all about where water runs, make it walk, is a common phrase to understand this. Think of, this, think of a landscape as intestines. And swales are the best example of, of intestines, right? So if you think about if we had intestines that went from our mouth right out the backside, would we get much nutrients? Would we extract much nutrient out of our food? Straight shot? No, right? It's all about back and forth, back and forth. It's all about surface area, interchange. The more surface area, all life is dependent on surface area and a high, as much amount of interchange as possible. But that's what we're doing with our water system. That's the basis of regeneration on land, is, is a high degree of interchange in the cycling every resource as many times on site as possible. And that starts with water. Right? If we don't do it with water, we're not doing it with our soil, that's for sure. Right. So the old organic farming mantra I, I love, and I used to all be, be all about it. It's all about the starts and ends with the soil. It's all about the soil. Stupid, right? It's soil, soil, soil. Well, that's true. But first, it's about the water. If you don't manage your water first, you're not managing your soil well. And that's a, a something that organic veggie growers, what I call conventional organic farmers, should take to heart. I don't mean to rip on anyone who grows a lot of veggies. It's very productive. But you got to ask yourself the question, what happens? Where I, walk around your farm and wherever you're standing, ask yourself, where's the water go when it lands on this spot? Right? If, are you cycling it? Are you slowing, spreading, and sinking it? Right? I'm not saying veggies and tillage potentially doesn't even have a role. It doesn't have a role. It does. But if we're losing our water, it's a one-way flow. Um, and that's to be avoided, you know, also just purely from an economic standpoint alone. Um, so here's what happens on most landscapes. On all landscapes, to some extent, especially if they're sloping, most water, when it hits a slope, depending on the degree of health of that slope, runs off. A lot of it, let's say. Uh, most slopes, I would say, most actually, most of that water does run off. If indicated by the arrows, big arrows meaning high amounts of water flow, small arrows being less, very little infiltrates most slopes in a degraded landscape. As I said, we're mostly on degraded landscapes. If you check the water flow, so it has to slow down, spread out, and sink, all of a sudden you change the whole situation. The easiest way to check the water flow is to build a swale. It's the biggest bang for the buck. You can do it with ponds, you can do it with terraces, kind of, you can do it with patties, but a swale is the easiest way to do it. You just make, on contour, on a line of eco elevation, you make a little ditch where water can sit and not rush off the slope. This is the easiest way to, to visualize it. And then all of a sudden, you completely change the behavior of how water interacts with that landscape. Right? All of a sudden, water now has to spread out in that ditch behind the mound and sit there. When it sits there, it evaporates. It sinks into the soil in the mound and below and gets evaporated by the plants. And it also infiltrates back into the groundwater to recharge our most important water storage, which is our aquifers, you know, one of our most important uh, water storages. All right, so then this is the process. So first we identify the suboptimal condition, right? That's water moving off of the landscape. Not good. No one's benefiting from that. You're losing value if, if that's happening on your site. Structurally address the problem. That's structural. That's like a physical addressing of, of the problem. It's not tweaking. It's, it's changing the whole situation. It's 
It involves an excavator or a bulldozer or handwork, but actually changing the shape of the earth, depending on scale, right? Then, once the, we've done that structural adjustment, the earth shape, that's the first layer, we can start adding the biology. That's the second layer. Too often, we jump to this third, second um, step, which is adding the biology, the plants or the animals. But that's, that comes after the structural adjustment, right? So first, when you get on a piece of land or walk around your own to assess it, look at the earth shape. That's the baseline, right? There's a thing called the Yeoman Scale of Permanence. Has anyone heard of that? Very important to understand. Check that out online if you're interested. This is one of the most important things you could, you could um, look into is this Yeoman Scale of Permanence, the scale of permanence of how changeable different characteristics of a landscape are. And this guy, Pia Yeomans, who is this just genius farmer in Australia um, about 50, 60 years ago, realized this just such a basic understanding of landscape. It's amazing that no one articulated it earlier. Probably indigenous people have understood it for a long time, but didn't potentially articulate it to the modern world, that there are some things more permanent than others in terms of features of landscape. Climate is pretty permanent. Earth, the shape of the land is pretty permanent. What plants are there? The soil, actually, even, those are very changeable. So first address the things that are least changeable, and then go layer by layer down the scale of permanence. So first we change the shape of the land, then we add or ad address the shape of the land, then add biology. So we go from this, suboptimal, to structural adjustment, to plant layer, to grazing layer. And it can, it can also, this, these two can swap. But what we usually do is plant the swales, and then we graze it. And then you're really cycling the carbon on site and creating quick cycling carbon pathways. You're, you're taking, you're basically turning atmospheric carbon and nitrogen into soil as quickly as possible when you layer this all together. From a water standpoint and from a, from a, a biological um, plant and animal standpoint. It's from a soil food web standpoint. This is an example of just planting along the contour, not, on con not off contour, right? On contour just means a line of equal elevation. These, these swales aren't going up and down a slope, right? They're going along, across a slope. This is what these systems look like um, right after they're planted. This is a sea berry, plum, pear, hazelnut system. This is right after a rainfall. And we're looking southwest. You can see the water in there. If I came back 20 minutes later, the water was gone, right? This is actually, and these swales were actually almost full right after the rainfall. We had like a two-inch rain event. And what I've realized from our swales is that from what we're doing on our 10 acres is that we can catch all of our rainfall in the growing season below a four-inch rain event. When Hurricane Irene happened, it was only the last, our bottom pond was, was three feet down when the storm came in, and that pond did not fill, and water started running out the overflow of the pond until we were two-thirds of the way through the storm, till four of Six, four inches of six had fallen. So the first four were all totally shock absorbed into the site. And now we actually have thousands of more feet, hundreds of more feet of swale on this property. So every foot, lineal foot of swale, you can think of as adding inches of travel to the shocks in your system. Think about like the shock on a mountain bike. The, the bigger that shock, the more into energy you can absorb. When you lay in swales, ponds, terraces, and patties, you're adding depth to that shock. And right now, we're in a position where we can absorb everything on our acreage plus 25 acres above us, four inches or less, we can absorb all of it, and most of it even above, above four inches. We'll see. The next, maybe we'll get a rain event that's eight inches. I hope not, or 10 or 12. Some point we will, and we'll see what we can absorb then. But right now, we're in a complete water storing standpoint. We're not contributing to any rise of the river on those 35 acres, if, unless it rains more than four plus inches. Imagine if we did that over our whole landscape, or even over a bunch of it, over our whole working landscape. What would the Mad River have gotten in Irene instead of 21,000 cubic feet per second? Maybe it would have been 18, 15, I don't know. But it's a, that's a flood mitigation standpoint, as well as a working landscape strategy, these, these swales. There's a, there's a profound impact there in terms of flood control. So now the biological layer, this is the same place about a year and a half later, two years later, and the hazelnut's getting about eight feet tall, the sea berries, you can see all the sea berry on them, and we're grazing it. And it's all about timing in here for these animals, Icelandic sheep, which kind of like to browse, not to destroy these perennials. If they're left there long enough, they will. And there's an important principle there that everything that can be, any tool that can be um, 
a, a, that can facilitate regeneration can also be a tool for destruction, right? Fire, water, animals, grazing. Grazing can destroy landscapes, and grazing can heal landscapes. Same with water, same with fire. All of these, it's all about timing. It's all about frequency and, and, and um, intensity of applying these tools. So that's, that's the nuance here. That, that's very, very important because people are very simple. We tend to be very simple-minded with these things. We think, oh, well, cattle have destroyed a good chunk of the world. Cattle are bad. No, that's, not, that's just not how it works, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a more subtle layer to that, right? There's nothing more soil building than intensive rotational grazing, as far as we can tell, for the most part. There's also nothing to destroy soil faster than a, a mob of cattle that are never moved on a site. Right, so we rotate these animals through quickly, quick cycling, high intensity grazing. And once we've started in with the animals, the lushification, the greenness, the amount of health that's come to the land has gone way up since before. You know, we kind of didn't graze for about five years, and then we started grazing for about five years. And even when we brought ducks and chickens in, which was our first layer, the, 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 the um, thickness of the sward of grasses and the greenness and how long it was green throughout the season and the rate of growth and the diversity all started to go way up, especially when we brought sheep in. I'll talk about that in a minute. This is making swales. Um, a good principle here is, you know, there's things you might do to establish a system that you don't want to do for the long haul. I don't certainly want to depend upon an excavator. I own a small excavator because we do this work for clients as well. But it costs a lot to own, and it's super energy intensive, and it's just not here for the long haul, right? But it can help us establish systems overnight that will last for thousands of years. So there's, there's actions we'll take to establish a system that we deliberately won't want to depend on for the long haul. But think about a tractor farm. Without that tractor, you ain't farming, right? If you're tillage-based vegetable farming. That's, an, that's a maintenance dependency. OK, I'm OK, and I think there's a resiliency in, ha in using something to establish a system, but only if you don't depend on that mechanism for the long haul. And that's where I think right now we have an opportunity. We have a window into where we're at the tail end, at some point at the tail end of, cheap, of the cheap energy world, where these things are available. And I, I think of it as you know, use it or lose it, right? We can, you, we can turn a gallon of fossil fuel into 1,000 feet of swale, or that gallon of fossil fuel will be used up bombing people in Syria or wherever, right? or on a trip to the mall. And you didn't end up with swales, right? That's kind of what it comes down to. I mean, I first, when I got this landscape, I was pr pretty fresh out of college. Like, we're going to do all this by hand. And I realized, OK, that will work. And we'd have the system that we have now in 50 years, or 30, or 20. And the oil would still be burned up, right? Um, it's, a, it's a big conversation to have. But I think it'll be hard to explain to our kids, if they're digging all day, every day for months on end, why, you know, what would you do with your oil, right? What'd you do with it when you guys had it? Wait. Because these things are permanent. There's earthworks that are in place from 10,000 years ago in parts of Asia. We'll outlive all of us, all of our buildings, and everything else. The earthworks are the most, in, the most permanent infrastructure. So they're very easy to justify investing in, right? Work out that, um, you know, that compounded value over 5,000 years. Until the ice sheet rolls in again, we'll have these swales, right? Or the comet, that, that, that same comet again. Um, right, so here's swales at a larger scale. This is small scale. You can do this by hand if you have a good group of people pretty quickly, too. Um, we make the swales pretty tall because they tend to settle. You don't want to compact them. The idea is an infiltrating system. It's not a pond berm. It's very different. Here's a swale we made. We had a large excavator on site on our farm in Rochester, Vermont. And we're basically turning what was a, is a depleted hay field that's been hayed and hayed and hayed to death for the last 30, 40 years into an agro, for, into a grazed, into what's still a hay field, also grazed and also producing perennial polycultures in hedgerows on and just below the swales where we're now catching all of the water instead of letting it rush off site. Um, it'll still be hayed, and that's, the, I think, one of the neat parts about it. So this is making the system. We had a large excavator on site to, to dig a foundation, and so we just rented it for another month um, to dig these swales. It's really good if you have a tilt bucket to do swales this way. We do a lot of hand work. This is in our permaculture design course, hand working about a 500-foot-long swale here. Um, this is what it looks like looking south now. This is during, again, during our permaculture course. 
everyone's camping, we're planting a sea berry swale here. And then we rake in seed, and then we hay it and plant it all at the same time. You want a seed, anytime you make bare soil, you want to seed it as soon as possible, right? Or you give an opportunity for weed seed and stuff is just blowing around, dispersive things to come in. And also for lack of soil stabilization and erosion to happen. So we seed it right off the bat. I like to say heavy equipment should come with seed strapped to the side of it because you're going to need it. <laughs> if you don't, if you run heavy equipment and don't seed, uh, unless you're putting gravel over everything and making a driveway and you're not creating any bare soil next to the driveway, you need, you need seed. And you need a lot of it. Um, it's good. We like to seed lightly and often. We'll seed most swales three to ten times because one seeding won't just get it all going unless you get perfect weather. And the best time to do these systems, all of these earthworks, is in the early spring. These are three ponds I built this summer, this spring, um, looking northeast from our site in Rochester uh, in the North Hollow. And um, this was done in June. And by late July, this was all greened up, clove, billions of clover coming up and vetch, turnips, radish. We have a master kind of, we call it the master mix of seed that we make up, 10 to 20 species. And we just spread it around whenever we create bare soil. And then it, oftentimes we'll, we'll mulch it. Not always, but usually. It's best practice to mulch it with hay after, or, well, straw, not so much in Vermont. This is this winter, this is like three weeks ago before we started getting snow, this is that same swale you just saw photos of. Planted with apples, this one is, um, with ca cages around it. And then we're going to replant this. We're going to add the understory this spring. We're planting about 5,000 plus trees there on this property this spring. It'll be, I think, the largest agroecological planting in well, probably New England, definitely Vermont, as far as I know, um, this spring we're going to stitch plants up every few feet we'll have a plant um, for another 10,000 feet of swales or so on this property. So you can see right here, we can actually flood these swales from ponds. These are those ponds I just showed a photo of before. We can actually empty these ponds or the top foot or two into these swales during the dry part of June and July and August when there's water in the ponds because of springs, but no water in the dry hay field. That's a key line strategy. That's the idea of spreading excess water from where it's abundant to where there's a lack of, which means taking water from the valleys and putting, them on the, putting that water on the ridges. That's, that's part of the essence of what key line agriculture is. Very important. P.A. Yeomans also articulated that, maybe in some ways invented that. Probably didn't invent that idea. We've, in the Mayans and other cultures, I'm sure, have done that. But he formally articulated it. Such a basic idea, but yet so brilliant and something we don't, under don't understand or see enough in our landscape. Um, here's another uh, example of what's happening on our own, on our 10-acre site, um, how we actually fertilize and irrigate at the same time. This is taken from my book, and it's, it's well explained in here. Um, so in, in the interest of time, I won't go through this, but um, basically we absorb all of our water from uphill. We store the water, that any water that flows out of the swales, we store in ponds. We take that water and we siphon it to small pools where we allow access for ducks. And sometimes we'll actually take burlap bags full of manure from the barn in the winter, sink them in there, make these kind of crazy manure tea little pools, and then we'll siphon gravity feed out of those pools into our rice paddies and also water perennials or even annuals in basically a form of gravity feeding manure tea across the landscape. And that's really how these systems should be set up from scratch. We only learned to do this because we made rice patties and we started flood irrigating the rice from the pond. And then we realized, wait a minute, we could fertilize, inject this at the same time. It's kind of like what a modern, it's almost a primitive version of like a modern fertility injected system looks like. Um, but it's done in a way that's unbreakable. I mean, you get half inch or three quarter polytubing keep it out of the sun, it's there for a long, long time. There's no pump needed. It's an unbreakable system. As long as the, the force of gravity works, this, this will happen for you. Um, this is making uh, rice patties. I'll just click through these real quick so you can see the process. We do a lot of tours on the property, so people come to help us plant our rice crop because they want to learn what's involved. This is a group from yesterday that came out. We're planting our rice here. This is when it starts to flower in July. Um, it's what it looks like starting to be later in the season. You can get 5,000 pounds of rice per acre. It's double the, the, the terrestrial yield of most grain, yet you can grow it on subsoil. This is, there's no topsoil here. We dug these patties. We're growing it in the fertility of the water. 
So it's an, and that's what's so interesting about it. The rice is kind of cool, but the patties, the fact that you can grow a crop in an a fertility accumulating system, not a fertility losing system, in a depression, not a convex system like a row that's always losing. Our vegetable gardens, where we grow most of our veggies, they're always losing. We always have to bring compost back to them. Not the rice patties. They're actually gaining, you know, think about how wetlands accrue fertility. When you mine out an old wetland, it's accrued fertility for hundreds of thousands of years, like old peat bogs and wetlands. This is what's happening naturally here. It's a sink. It's a deposition zone. Rice just happens to be a species that can take inundation and grow in these nutrient accumulating parts of the landscape. So this is uh, one of our ducks, Coco Chanel, and one of her babies. Um, she's been... She's been a really good mother, and we've been integrating ducks and rice, which is a very old form of agriculture for the last few years. It's hard to get the timing just right. Again, it's all about timing with so many of these systems. But has anyone read The Power of Duck? Heard of it? <laughs> it's about how ducklings, essentially ducks and rice, are probably this co-evolved system. The, the rice is too high in silica for ducklings to, to digest. So they cruise through the patties when the rice is just establishing it, without knocking the rice over or touching it, and they eat all the weeds and poop those weeds out, fertilizing the rice. Perfect system, right? Really, if half of our systems were half this perfect, we'd be totally silent. Right? This is an old form. This is an old system we've inherited. Um, this is the, partly the result probably of breeding and of really getting super sophisticated with integrated agriculture. Really neat to see, this, <coughs> see that happen. Um, I'll point out here, I'd be remiss to not point out, that you know, food is one thing, being fed is, is one thing. It's an important part of, of a resilient lifestyle, a secure, you know, food security. But um, staying warm is you know, in some ways even more important. This is a good winter to talk about this because this is what it does around here pretty much every winter. It gets 20 degrees below zero without the wind chill, right? We don't count wind chill in Vermont. That's for like people in Washington, DC or something, right? It doesn't, doesn't count, right? It's just, it's cold. It's real cold up here. Um, so we need to stay warm. If you don't want your house freezing and water flowing everywhere once the power comes back on. And there's, no, there's, no, um, there's nothing it compares with cordwood in a cold, cloudy climate with, with wood as a heating source. People may get all excited about pellets or solar, this or that. But the fact is, we don't get much sun in a good chunk of the winter. Until February comes around in most of New England, it's not too sunny. And what's reliable is burning the stored sunlight in the form of wood. And so from a resiliency standpoint, I would put out there that we all need a source of wood heat if you live in this climate. And you got to also know how to use these systems really well. What we are able to do is get basically heat 1,500 square feet of home on a cord of wood, which is anyone heat with wood, right? That's a pretty low amount of use. Now, our home's really well insulated. That's a big part of it. But we also burn the wood very well. And I would emphasize here that drying wood is key for that. Most I drive all around Vermont. I've done like almost 200 site consults around the state. I get to see what people are doing. And most of the time, I see people slowly rotting wood. You ever see a stack of wood and people tarp it when they get it? That's a great way to grow mushrooms, right? Tarp wood that's already loaded with moisture against the ground, which is not dry. And our ground is never dry, <laughs> at least not more than a handful of inches down. You want it to get sunshine. You want it to get air. And you want it to not have rain going onto it. So a shed that gets good exposure and good wind flow, or just scrap plywood and scrap roofing is what we use. It's easy, it's cheap, it's fast. You'll get really dry wood, and then every ounce of water that you're boiling off of, of the cordwood, the less water you boil out. Because if any moisture in your cordwood has to boil off, sucking heat. If you remember back to like seventh or eighth grade physics, when you boil water, it's a huge energy sink. The less water you're boiling, the better. Wood is very wet. It holds moisture better than anything in this climate, right? Wood. It's over 100% by weight water, usually, when it's cut. It takes a full growing season to dry if you're drying it in good conditions. We dry it very, very well, and then we burn it um, in our buildings. Uh, here's just some examples of, of very durable, resilient infrastructures, a SketchUp drawing of our, of our design studio here. Um, Again, heats on, on, 1500, on uh, one quart of wood. You see the wood drying there. Tall, narrow stacks off the ground. Um, it's timber framed all from wood from the property. Won't last as long as our earthworks, but it should last a while. Um, we use it as support for our food system, for our hardy kiwis. Um, some other shots of our infrastructure here. Our greenhouse we built last year with our Jean Payne 
composting mound where we're, you know, as manure and wood chips rot, it is heating our greenhouse um, with tubes that you circulate water through. Um, just some other infrastructure shots here, and I'll get back to what I was chatting about. This is a barn we just built down in Rochester. Um, should be around for the long haul. When you go to build a building, you're going to use a lot of energy. It's going to take all your time and then some, and it's going to be a huge expense. And I think the best way to approach it is to build it for the long haul. So you have to build it again as few times as possible, or work on it, or renovate it, or fix it as few times as possible. It's not a living system. It's not accruing value. It's dis the second you finish a built system or a piece of technology, it starts to fall apart. So best to make it as durable as possible. It's not increasing in complexity and, and order and um, robustness like when you plant a tree, you walk away, that tree is getting if it's an oak or a pine nut, it's accruing value for 400 years. Buildings aren't like that, at least not until we're a whole nother level of, of species that we can make living buildings. Um, this is how we burn our wood, multiple functions from single expenditures, right? Here's a, here's a single system, our wood stove, but we cook on it, we bake in it, we get firelight off of it, it dries all sorts of stuff from apples um, to herbs, medicinal herbs to also cordwood if stuff got a little wet in the pile. Um, it also heats all of our hot water, enough hot water for two people to shower or bathe extravagantly every day um, for free, just as a matter of, of course, while we're also heating 1,500 square feet. Amazing how, how cheap and it, how, this, is, this is the most bang for the buck anyone could do in their home. We've basically, if we were buying our wood, which we're not, we'd be spending $400. We're up to now two cords since we're heating our hot water. That takes almost a cord by itself on a cold winter. Uh, so if we were buying wood, we'd be spending, let's say, three, dollars $400 for all of our heat and all of our hot water and most of our cooking for a whole year. Now, I don't know what your bills are in this climate, but most people spend like two, three thousand dollars $3,000 on that. The guy, a neighbor who gave us this electric hot water tank, gave it away because probably couldn't afford or didn't want to keep paying what was over $1,000 a year just to heat his hot water. Forget heating his place, because an electric hot water heater, it was still good, it didn't leak, so we just plumbed it to our, hot, our, our wood stove, and it thermosiphons, no pump, heats our hot water. We have a video on this online so people can see if you're interested in how this works. We also experiment with growing our firewood, because just having firewood be produced randomly in a wood lot is fine if you have a big wood lot, but we're on 10 acres with immature forest. With heating a bunch of different buildings, that's not necessarily a sustainable supply of wood, even if we do it really well with really insulated buildings. So how do you turn as much carbon into firewood as possible on a site? There's one species that does it better than anything else in this climate. Anyone know what that might be? Here's 50, of, 50 trees of them. Black. Black locust, yeah. It's just the fastest way to turn carbon from the atmosphere and put it into soil and into lignin and cellulose into a usable form. It grows as fast as poplar or birch, or even faster, almost as fast as a hybrid poplar, but it's as dense as white oak and hickory. Total anomaly, right? Nothing's like that. If something grows fast, it's like pretty shitty wood usually, right? If like poplar, that's not great wood. Um, willow, it's not dense. It's not good firewood. Here's something that's like a fast growing hickory, very fast growing. On hyper, hickory on steroids or a white oak, you know, hyperdrive white oak. We grow them on swales in a grazing system, of course, always integrated. And we graze these systems and then we harvest firewood on the mounds. We're about six years into this, so we're at the point where we have valuable fence posts. Black oak is also the most drought resistant wood probably you can grow here. So just by itself, that's an enormous value because there's not a lot of what rot resistant species we can grow here, especially super rot resistant like black locust. Here's Mark Shepard when he visited our place looking up at our alders. He was just thinking, this is cool, but you need 10,000 of these. He does it at pretty large scale. Um, this is black locusts as well being grazed. The, the sheep love them. They're very high. high um, the leaves are very high in protein. Leguminous leaves, it's fixing nitrogen also. It's, in a, it's a gift of the gods plant. It's incredible. It's also edible. There's 101 uses for black locusts. You can eat the flowers. They say you can raise more honey on an acre of black locusts than anything else. I don't know if it's true, but even if it's up there, just another reason to plant black locust. Um, this is our leach field. We, we experiment with growing on that. It's the most productive spot on most properties. You might as well grow more than a lawn with it, right? Look at that productivity. 
Um, we do a lot of different things to establish systems on poor sites. Foliar feeding them is one of them. Very low tech. These things can last a while. And you can get a tree established that otherwise would take a lot of mulching or would even be very difficult to do. Once it's established, you don't need to do this foliar feeding forever. It starts to get a soil ecosystem going. The plant gets established, gets strong, starts to perpetuate uh, its own needs. Our animal systems are, are getting more extensive over the years, although goats were one way we went that we realized, nope, goats the opposite of a tree. So let's, we want to grow a lot of trees. Got to watch out for goats, right? Plus, they steal the show, and everyone else, all the other animals don't like them because they're just like the center of attention. The sheep, you know, the sheep are like, come on, why don't you pay attention to us here a little bit? And the dog, too. But they're everyone's best friend, except, again, for your favorite trees. They know which ones are your favorite. So if you like trees, which we do, you got a tough time with goats. Um, not that they don't have a role, especially in like early on system establishment. If you're converting old field, goats and pigs, you know, those are two real system establishment plant uh, species. Ducks have been a favorite of ours. Um, they love white clover, and white clover also grows a lot of slugs. And we love white clover because it's a fantastic way to establish uh, after a bare soil being made. If this is a pond berm they're on when you make swales. Um, this is Mr. McDuckles, who we had a couple of years ago. Um, he, we had to get him out of our cabbage patch at this moment. He was coming in there to eat some of our cabbage. So they're, you know, they have challenges. They, they need to be managed. We find we can keep them managed with four, uh, 12 to 18 inches of fence. People come out, they're like, what are all these little things you're trying to trip me with? What are all these little stupid fences? They can't, must not be able to keep anything out. They keep our ducks managed. The duck, could the ducks fly over? Sure, the ducks could fly over to Warren or Waitsfield if they wanted to, but they don't because they're creatures of habit like most animals, and you, the fences just guide them. And also, we're around a lot. I wouldn't leave a system like that, you know, I wouldn't do my cows that way and have 30 acres that way and then get out. But if you're in zone one and two, you can manage. We try to do the least amount of effort for the maximum amount of result, right? Everything, how lazy of a system can you make and still have it work? That's, that's kind of partly uh, how to approach these things. Um, there's um, Jangles and Akira with one of our new rams a few years ago. Um, we sometimes milk the sheep when it's, we, ha we have in the past when it's the right time. Um, this is our intensive rotational grazing shot of just what you want when you're grazing animals. You don't want to graze low plants. You want to graze high plants, bring it down pretty low, and then give it a real rest. The timing there is key. We graze everything. This is, um, oh, head cut off by mistake. It's sheep, we're moving away from sheep toward cows because sheep, as anyone keeps sheep, they, you know, they kind of have a lot of needs um, at times. So um, they've been a little bit high maintenance. I mean, they're great, but the fencing also is much greater need than with cows. So we're going to try moving towards larger grazing animals, see how that goes, especially with our, our other piece of land that's a larger scale. Hazelnuts have been great. Bur oaks, a very fast-growing nut tree. Hazel, uh, or actually, excuse me, what, anyone know what this is? Hawthorn. Hawthorn, yeah, fantastic medicine, very powerful medicine we all used to have in our yards when we lived in Europe, or those of us that in a past life or in our ancestors did. Uh, they grow up, they're weedy, they grow up everywhere now. You can put uh, pears right on them, so you can create a deer-proof deer pear orchard right off the bat if you have hawthorns. Just graft them above browse line and you have an insta-pear. Um, you can do this with a bunch of different species. We grow a lot of shiitake, um, low value, great way to add value to low, va to, uh, low value pole wood, like red maple. Um, all, all, many species you can actually grow shiitake on. We find sugar maple's the best. 30% um, protein, super loaded with micronutrients. It's really a food medicine. It's really both. Um, you dry them, you want to dry them gills face up. Um, it's a great way, you, working with mycelium is a great way of, of transforming a low va lower value form of life or material into higher order, higher complexity form of life, right? Mycelium is to soil and fungi is to soil as plants are to, uh, are to wood chips as plants are to soil, right? That's how we transform woody debris into life and value is using mycelium and fungi. Same way you use plants to transform soil into value. Wine caps trafari have been great for us. We've sold a bunch of that locally. At different times, it comes and goes throughout our, our, our property. Oyster mushrooms have been great. We're starting to get honey from the land, which is amazing. You start to actually get the kind of nectar feeding off of the flowers of the plants you planted. It's really a neat full circle that's been coming on in the last couple of years. We had morels one year from what we established, but they didn't come back. Um, 
just some of the shots of what's on our, on our farm here. Um, this is like late March, a good example of what we're eating now. You know, 10 years in now, we're starting to realize when we look at a plate of food that most of what's on that plate most of the time is from within 100 yards of where we're eating. Um, and, you know, it's interesting how that creeps up. In the last couple years, I started to realize when I go into the Hunger Mountain Co-op in Montpelier, you know, I don't... I can walk through the produce department, but I don't need anything there. I mean, sure, there might be something I want that we don't have, but it's like, well, I've got 100 pounds of something else that's similar to that in the root cellar. Um, and it's neat how that kind of catches up with you. It accumulates. Um, and it's really amazing because there's nothing more affordable than keeping a vegetable garden. I mean, just pull it back to very simple things. All these different things I'm saying are great. All of the intentional, um, very complex agroecosystems, but just keeping a vegetable garden just from an affordability standpoint, is the easiest, you know, it's the easiest bang for the buck anyone could do. You will save thousands of dollars in your first year if you do it well and have a bit of sunny land. Um, this is our lamb sausage here, our potatoes, our jalapenos, our greens, sauerkraut, kimchi, um, garlic. We grow more of that every year. It's hard, it's kind of crazy not to grow garlic because it's just too easy to do. I mean, it's so easy to propagate. If there's one plant we should be growing, all should probably grow some of its garlic. It's very powerful medicine, powerful antibiotic, so easy on the soil. It's so easy to perpetuate and actually breed yourself on site by saving bulbs. It's uh, really just kind of a no-brainer. Some of our fresh salads throughout the, most of the year, now with a greenhouse throughout the whole year, shiitake mushrooms, duck eggs, honeyberry, which is the earliest fruit in the year. We're planting hundreds of these. They're called hascaps in Canada. They're the earliest nectar source in zone one. They're hardy to, so if the, Global ocean conveyor belt stops or some kind of crazy stuff happens. Honeyberry is a big hedge, right? They're hardy literally to zone one, I think, zone two. Um, they fruit earlier than strawberries. And they're really, really tasty. They're like a blueberry when you let them mature, a little tartar. So really high in anthocyanins and phytochemicals, really good. They're food and their medicine. Silvetta arugula is a big favorite of ours. There's our garlic crop, some of it. Right. I mean, um, end here on the medicinal piece, because staying fed is one thing. Staying healthy is going to be a whole nother challenge, probably much more difficult. Right? Because we just, for, uh, one example of this, forget the coal, forget everything else. We got 104 of these scary red dots just in this country alone. Anyone know what these are? Yeah, there's a, 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 a nearly out of control, waiting to get out of control chain reaction happening at every one of these spots. And without continual energy input and, and vigilance at these places for hundreds of years, there's a catastrophe, right? So probably there'll be more. Unfortunately, we just built these 40, 50 years ago. They're just nearing the end of their lifespan. One crazy gamble we made to just hurl a bunch of, um, a bunch of craziness into the future a few thousand, for a few thousand years that we decided to do in the wake of World War II with World War II technology, right? So we're gonna feel that we're just starting to feel the, the wakes of that impact. We will be feeling impacts of this experiment for probably, a, for literally at least a thousand years or more, um, unless there's some miracle, which, you know, is, is, a, is a slim bet. Um, the attacks on, on the human cellular health will be continuing for a very long time. So focusing on the medicinal piece is really important. And that's where we're moving in the last couple of years. Um, this is a giant reishi mushroom uh, that my wife and I found a couple of years ago, uh, actually just a year ago, um, probably the biggest mushroom on reishi I'll ever find in this lifetime, just amazing. Um, uh, we're really working with the plants and fungi that promote health as intensely as possible, that are most potent. Food is one thing, powerful medicinal quality produce from the land is a whole nother. And that, unfortunately, will be a growth industry. As long as toxicity is a growth industry, preventative medicine will be a growth industry as well, especially as we're wrapping our heads around the values of this. Um, this is reishi, turkey tail, chaga, which we have on the wood stove all winter long and drink, you know, at least weekly. It's a major health tonic, um, anti-carcinogen, especially the turkey tail. They're adaptogenic. Here's some of what other medicine looks like. It's kind of amazing that we think of medicine today. It's an indication of where we're at health-wise. We think of medicine as those things, artificially colored capsules, right? That's medicine. Well, medicine looks like this, right? Medicine actually, preventative medicine is beautiful. I mean, it's always beautiful, preventative medicine. And that's kind of interesting um, to realize. 
that that what helps provide us with health is is looks beautiful in the landscape and looks beautiful in its processing. Anyone know what these are? Milky oats, yeah, great medicine, way to turn oats, actually use oats medicinally. Seaberry is one of our favorite medicinals, aronia, blackberry, elder, just a quick tour through some of the medicines that we're working with. Seaberry, again, probably our favorite one, it's a nitrogen fixing medicinal berry, so it's hard not to drink gallons of this stuff. Um, but one teaspoon a day is therapeutic, loaded with essential fatty acids. It's been a, a favorite medicinal for hundreds, if not thousands, of years in northern Europe. It's, it's apparently endangered in Hungary because people wildcraft this so heavily. We're planting them by the hundreds. Um, again, they're a nitrogen-fixing shrub. They're like elderberry, but they fix nitrogen. And they're orange. They're loaded with bioflavonoids and essential fatty acids. Um, my wife, who's a naturopath and really great herbalist, thinks there's not enough research on them, but she thinks that it might be a more powerful tonic and health-maintaining plant than an elderberry. And elderberry is very powerful, strong, antiviral. So we try to not drink all of this every day, but we drink a lot of it. They're great for salves. I mean, the industry for sea berries mainly for, um, which is crazy, is for um, skin. It's amazing because of essential fatty acids for and high-end skin care. But it's too, I mean, that's nice, but it's so valuable for to take internally. I can't imagine. I mean, we do make some salve because we have a lot. Uh, we grow more sea berry now than Anyone, than anyone we know of in the United States, and, and certainly I think in New England, um, we're, we're big on this plant. Um, but in Canada, they grow them by the tens of thousands. They're, they're already way up on, on sea berry as a prairie restoration, a prairie windbreak. They're, they're Siberian. They, they naturalize on, um, on uh, sand dunes in Siberia. So they're salt tolerant, zone two hardy, you know, honey badger types of plants. Um, this is dried, just incredible. We get um, a lot of uh, peaches some, on some years, plums. These are, these are fun. They're, they're, they have some, some health values, but they're also a lot more finicky. Um, they're good to contrast with sea berry, right? This is some of, the, some of the nutrients we harvest now. And we think about it from a standpoint of nutrients. We look too much at weight, at poundage of produce, at um, calories of produce. But if you look at it you know, nutrient-wise, this is thousands of, of pounds worth of nutrients if you are trying to get this out of like lower value um, foods. Like, has anyone heard how now we need 40 apples to equal the nutrients and is in one apple of our grandparents because of what was in the soil? Right, so we think about growing nutrients, we have to think very carefully about how we remineralize our soils and also about what we grow. Um, again, just food being one thing, nutrients being another. And some plants accrue nutrients a lot better than others. There's a bowl full of nutrients, and they also taste really good. Uh, this fall, hardy kiwi, which we grow right up our studio, plums, akebia, which are really neat. You spoon them out. They're like custard. Um, hardy kiwi dried. Now, processing is the bottleneck with all this stuff, right? It's one thing to grow it all. What we're having challenges with in the last couple of years is like dealing in August, September, and October. That's where... It comes to this, you know, you're getting this over-yielding system. And so that's where the bottleneck is with it. It's, it. It becomes a real processing challenge. And as we see, even in the local organic farming and, and food system, is our bottleneck is processing in Vermont more than production, although we have a long way to go in terms of production as well. This is dried kiwi, dried apples up in the, in the rafters. Um, elderberry, we make them into tinctures as well. We sell some of this stuff on our website, by the way. I'll mention at the end, sauerkraut, food medicine, some others. This is what the pantry starts to be filled with. So I'll just end on this note, right? This is really what I'm realizing is a way of crafting an ecosystem. We think of craft as what we do on the built end of things, right? This is a, a stone wall, a stone uh, bridge made by hand in Hillsborough, New Hampshire, made before the fossil fuel era in the 1800s that is outlasting bridges we made in the cheap energy era 40 years ago, which are already falling down. And this will, is going strong, might live another 100 or four or 500 years. But it was built with a high level of skill. It was a work of craft. That's what we're talking about on the living systems front, on the biological front. So you can think of the row of tilled vegetables as something very powerful and quick, like you know, the, something we do with a, a, a an abundance of fossil fuel, but if we're in it for the long haul, we have to think in terms of level of craft. I think most of the long-term values we're talking about here are intergenerational. 
right? Because what we're talking about right now, the de facto plan is we'll live on eating electronics, right? We'll just somehow subsist like Wall-E on, on uh, electronic pollution, right? Well, if we want to leave our kids with persimmons, which seem preferable to eat, then the iPhone, um, you know, just, just live on endocrine disruptors. That'd be pretty sweet. Um, you know, we got to be in it for the long haul. We have to establish these systems intergenerationally. Most of the, the highest yields don't come in year one, in year five. We're not even there yet. We're 10 years in. These, this is a ch planted chestnut forest above the Aegean Sea. This is planted for the kids, for the grandkids, for the great grandkids. You can't compare its outputs, right? The value of its outputs far exceed what we could ever get out of an annual plant. But you don't get them overnight. So we, got, we have to be in it for the long haul and think you know, in that intergenerational perspective. Here's nut pine nuts, right? They'll, they'll bear for 400 years in the millions of acres of taiga where shamanic tradition has emerged for thousands of years where these trees are existing, um, where they actually have a culture. This is their totem tree, like coconut is to the Polynesia. They, they uh, say how they start ringing in 500 years, and that's right, and they're ready to be cut down. This is intensely loaded with fat, with high nutrient fats, essential fatty acids, and protein. They'll bear for 400 years, but they don't start bearing for 10 or 20 or 30, right? That's kind of how it goes. The most worthwhile things take the longest to establish. So right now we have a window to establish these systems. Here's chestnuts. These are all from a, a farm in Vermont near Nico Rubens, a guy who had the foresight to plant these systems 20 years ago. Hopefully we'll have these yields uh, in the coming few years, maybe three to five years. But all the talk about it is, is nice, you know, all the blogging, all the books, but None of it matters unless we you know, get our hands dirty, get the shovels in the ground, get the seeds, get the plants, and really start planting up our systems with, with hundreds and thousands of plants. Um, all these principles are only good if we actually uh, take them to heart and get, get down and dirty. If you're interested in more, um, we have our permaculture design courses. We have two this summer. We might offer a third because the two are almost full. They're in July and August. Um, they're, they're a great opportunity. We eat really great food. We eat mostly, this year will be mostly food from the property, from, the, from the, our second property. We go through the entire design process that is permaculture design. It's very hands-on. It's much less academic than most permaculture courses than anyone I know of, actually. We do a lot of skills immersion. Jeff Lawton came by <laughs> when we were teaching our second one this year. Um, and it's also just a whole lot of fun. We do a lot of harvesting, seed saving. We do intensive workshops throughout. We plant systems. We um, dig swales. We practice sharpening, um, go through the design process, present designs, um, camp on site, beautiful places, um, enjoy the area, do a lot of swimming, um, hanging out. And um, we also have tours of our farm pretty often. Check our uh, book out for more information. I have a couple copies here. It's also down at the Chelsea Green booth. And uh, our website has a lot more information, our Facebook page as well. I'll hang out for a little while for questions, but thanks for listening right now. Appreciate it. <laughs>